Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I wanted to start just by welcoming everyone and you'll meet the panelists in a moment. Um, and I wanted to say absolutely thank you to them, but also to you all for joining us this evening and the alumni office in particular, Melissa Samuels for partnering with us on this event. Just in terms of a few really brief kind of housekeeping issues. Um, as you saw when you logged on, and as you can probably see right now, um, this webinar is being recorded. And that is wonderful because you all who are here can rewatch it and continue to learn from the conversations, but also it's something that we can share um, in the future uh, and all can learn from it. You will see um, towards the end of our panel this evening. So at about 7.45, we'll have an opportunity to see what questions you have for our exciting panelists today. Um, and I'm gonna ask that you put your questions, type your questions uh, in the Q&A tab. Uh, that will be the easiest way for me to find them. So that's our, our real uh, short introduction. Um, I will say I am Dr. Patricia Gettings. I am an associate professor in the Department of Communication and I will be sort of facilitating, moderating this event this evening. So I'll ask questions of the presenters and then um, stop us when it's time to uh, ask your questions. Okay, so without further ado, we have four uh, UAlbany alum, and some of them are, are double alum of our, pro of our programs, um, and they are Corey Ann Taylor, Ray Dorsley Jr., Dee Snape, and Jessica Levine. So I would love to welcome our panelists now to our program. All right. Hi and welcome. How are you tonight? Hello. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, Good right. So I really briefly introduced you with just your name, but I would love it if each of you could take a turn to introduce yourself a little bit, you know, more fully. Tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you currently do. And if you'd like to, um, sort of your, uh, the, the year or years that you um, graduated from um, our comm program. Let's see, I see Jessica first. So if you would go ahead and start for us, please. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, hi everyone. My name is Jessica Levine. I graduated from UAlbany with my bachelor's in political science in 2017, and then my master's in political communication in 2019. Right now, I work as a learning consultant at a company called Execcom, and I'm sure that all of us have gotten nervous before presentations, and what we do is we help people get rid of those nerves and teach them how to communicate with greater impact. So that's a little bit about what I do. Awesome. Corianne, you are unmuted. Can you go next, please? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Corianne Taylor. I am the head of marketing at Beyond Air. We are a global device and biopharmaceutical company. And um, I graduated in 2004, and I was really thankful that I was able to go part-time and continue work in the state Senate. So uh, the program at SUNY Albany allowed me to, co to combine my love of politics and communications. Um, you know, and I really enjoyed working on political campaigns and whatnot. Um, and then transitioned into agency life and then in-house on the marketing and biopharma side. So um, I also oversee uh, an our affiliate, all marketing communication for our affiliate uh, beyond cancer as well. So let's see who wants to go next. D. Sure. I'm so, hi, my name is Dee Snape. I'm currently a senior research associate at Reprise Digital, well, formerly known as Reprise Digital, we're now known as Canesso. We just went through a brand change recently, so excuse me for that. But uh, I am a senior research associate there, and I handle uh, the paid search campaigns on various pharmaceutical brands uh, for Johnson & Johnson as of right now. Um, I've been, since graduating, I've been at different agencies and came from graduating with a bachelor's in communications and my master's in organizational communications from UAlbany. Uh, just 
throughout that time. I worked in just different, like I said, different agencies and did had to sit in politics, just different fields and just until I got my way within uh, uh, digital marketing and advertising, basically. Awesome. Thank you. Ray? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I graduated, I came into Albany at 20... Yeah, wow, so far. 2007. Um, I came in as an EOP student uh, and an athlete. So I played uh, football all four years at the University at Albany. Um, I graduated 2011 in uh, uh, bachelor's in communications, uh, minor in business. And then I did my redshirt senior year and also finished my uh, communications master's. Uh, in 2012. Uh, I currently reside here in uh, Brooklyn, New York, and I currently work at Meta, formerly known as Facebook. I'm in a uh, developer marketing, uh, focused on specifically uh, VR and AR and AI. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of the buzzwords that you guys probably have been hearing a lot, and focused on uh, marketing to developers to create experiences and games, et cetera, to, to get a, consumers excited about our devices. And that's really it for now. <laughs> Thank you. And again, welcome. Um, so let's next, if you would, uh, be willing to share, you can do this in a few ways, but kind of how you got started in your role. So you may want to go back a little bit and think about, you know, maybe a first or a second role. You don't have to give us, you know, your whole resume, although yeah. you can, uh, but just in, interested in generally, how did you first get started in the role that you're, you're currently in? Does anyone want to jump in on that one? <laughs> I'll go. Oh, oh, thanks, Ray. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, interesting enough, I started in advertising, but I learned about advertising uh, through a panel similar to this one uh, around, I believe, my junior, senior year. Ty Curran uh, was on the panel. It was a student athlete, like alumni panel. And Ty Curran was on the panel. And he, at the time, he was the CEO of a agency uh, here in New York. And I, similar to this, literally, but in person, uh, I got his contact um, and I did a follow up and he put me in contact with somebody on it uh, internally from HR that could uh, help me uh, and just, you know, take my resume. And that's literally how I got my first job. But even to take a step back before that, uh, while I was at Albany, I was interning uh, in music. So I did Shady Records uh, and I would go back and forth sometimes uh, to here in the city. And then I also received another internship through alumni. I was in the alumni office a lot at Albany. Um, and I got an internship my grad school year uh, at Universal Republic over under Monty Lipman. Uh, and I was like pressed on doing music and so Prior to even getting that job in advertising, I utilized this alumni forum to receive an internship in music, which then I ended up tr transitioning out to. And I was in advertising for a while, I actually started in the pharma space. And then uh, I transitioned to consumer marketing where I was at uh, BBDO and Anomaly working on uh, NBA 2K and Foot Locker for many of years before making the transition to the brand side to, to Meta. What positions were you in at, for instance, BBDO? Like what was the title of that position? Account director. Okay. So it's always on the, the client uh, strategy side. Excellent. Thank you. I just wanted to say, I absolutely love that we have panelists who are who have been in pharmaceutical marketing because there aren't a lot of folks out there who understand the challenges of this extremely uh, <laughs> highly regulated industry. You know, highly and, regulated for sure. Right? Yeah. And I was looking at you know some of the questions, and it was talking about you know um, industry, where is the industry headed, and you know trends. And I was like, pharmaceutical marketing, we are so far behind those trends because we are so regulated, right? So mm -hmm. you have to be extremely creative, and you never want to get a letter from the FDA. So we're all a little paranoid. 
<laughs> yes, very, yeah, that was a great, great mention, great call out. Um, something that I wanted to mention that I just like spoke out to me similar, uh, similar to Ray, like I think I, I found it interesting that with him, he has different uh, paths within advertising. And I think that's something that I wanted to highlight, like even within my experience and with the students as well. Uh, similar to Ray, I also had an interest in music when I first was at UAlbany. Um, I was trying to find my way, trying to figure out, did I want to be in music? Did I want to do politics? Like, where did I want to go? And I, to get to like being a paid search specialist, I can tell you it was a journey, but I'm going to try to sum it up as quick as possible. Um, I first, one of my first internships while at UAlbany an undergrad was at High 97 and that's a radio station down here that I just learned just the different ins and outs of just marketing and within the radio stations but I understood that music just it felt scary to me I felt like there was just a little too dynamic I didn't know if I was going to keep a job and I just wanted to stay um you know you know just stay within a place that I knew I was going to have a job moving forward um I politics sounded good but I think just I didn't want to have just the emotional charge and work be something that like was like my day to day. So that kind of kept me out of politics. So long story short, I got into advertising um, through this organization called Co-op. Um, Ray might be familiar with the organization, but it's an organization that basically helped me hone and tie everything that I learned at UAlbany, both undergrad and grad school, into what's going on in the real world right now. So speaking on what's going on with industry trends, that organization Co-op did give me like the foundation of okay what is digital marketing today and I guess for me that was what 2018 so like what is marketing on Facebook what is marketing on TikTok what is marketing on Google and Bing and so that after getting that foundation I decided all right well where do I want to do marketing at and <laughs> ended up at agencies and things of that nature so just saying all of that to say that these are journeys that we all do go on yes and I mean, that's another thing, um, just, you know, I started in politics as well, um, you know, before I shifted out because I was working in the Pataki administration and as an appointee, when your person is done, you are also done. So then, you know, made the shift to um, PR and then into pharmaceutical marketing. And I will say that working in agencies is probably the best experience you could get, right? Because you are exposed to the latest creative tactics because you go through brand planning, tactical planning, and your clients always want to know like what's new, innovative tactics. They never want to pay for them, but they always want to know. <laughs> so, you yes. know, and it's, you know, it's like, okay, well, what's your budget? We can be really creative and innovative. Um, so, you know, it, it is a journey and, you know, my journey is very similar um, working at pharmaceutical marketing agencies you know, on and I was on the client services side. So a lot of, and worked very closely with our brand planning group, which was the area that I fell in love with is, you know, building brands, right? The market research, knowing your customers inside and out, knowing your products inside and out. So, you know, from there, I was in pharmaceutical marketing for about 12 years and I was looking for a change. And one area that I didn't necessarily have a lot of experience with, with was video marketing. So then I shifted, I had the opportunity to go run and oversee a video marketing production company that worked with pharmaceutical clients. Um, you know, I don't ever want to do a live webinar ever again, ever, ever again. That took years off my life. Don't do it. Anybody pre-record. Um, but, you know, and then learning a lot from that. And from there, I would recommend it, I worked at a startup. Startups are a great place to really get a lot of experience because you wear so many different hats, right? If you're working in client services, right? And you're you're not doing the paid search, you're not implementing, you have experts. So you get to tap into so much talent at an agency. And, you know, then you go work at a startup and you're like, I need to amend, or I need to fix some of these photos in a manual that's getting submitted to the FDA. I have to figure out how to use Photoshop. I did an all-nighter and figured out how to use Photoshop, how to do the overlays. And I reached out to one of my creative director friends and I was like, oh, you guys just create layers. And they're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. So yeah, I, I learned that. And Google, you can Google pretty much anything and find a tutorial. So yes, you know, and that's, that's where it's, I will say the position that I have today is a result of working in the agency. So I was leading 
um, you know, a product uh, that was, uh, it's nitric oxide, right? It's very niche. Um, it's a critical care product used in the NICU. I will say it does save babies. Um, and the thing is, is it's, there's a lot of off-label use. So that's where you cannot market and you have to be careful. Um, but I helped reposition that against uh, the product against a competitive threat. Then I kind of went to work at a behavioral health startup and the head of sales who I had worked with at Mallinckrodt reached out to me because one of the things is knowing your products, if you're on the agency side, your clients will rely on you so much because I'll be honest, they're kind of lazy and they're paying you to do their jobs. So if you know their products inside out and out, you know the competitors inside and out, you are so valuable. You become part of their team, right? And you get really great experiences from that. So you know, I was working, you know, as on this product and I left, went into behavioral health. The head of sales at Beyond Air called me and said, Corianne, oh my gosh, I'm working at this great company. I think you should apply. And I was like, well, I don't know. And she said, we make a drug out of air. And I said, no. She's like, we got rid of the tanks because there's there are these 45 pound cylinders, the way the drug and the gas was supplied. And I was like, no, this is not possible. And so there's, you know, so then I had applied for the job. They wanted me to work down in Garden City. And I was like, you know, and that's where you use your experience. I was like, I'm probably one of the only people besides the head of marketing at Mellencroft who has more experience with this product in the country, you know, so it's, you, you gotta like sell yourself too. And so then I was, I got the position and I get to work remote. Sometimes I have to go into Garden City. I travel a lot um, in hospitals, but it's like, taking that experience and marketing yourself and, you know, finding opportunities. And it's, it's really great, but agencies, I'm telling you, agencies are where it's at. You get to see a lot, learn a lot, exposed to a lot. So. Excellent. Jessica, do you want to share a little bit about your path? Yes. Um, so similarly to a few other people on the panel, I also got started in politics. Um, I interned for, and I did the semester long um, assembly internship when I was an undergrad. And then I was in, when I was in grad school, I had the opportunity to intern for Senator Schumer, which was an incredible experience. And while I was starting to look for jobs, I found out that Senator Schumer's former director of communications owned a PR firm. And that's how I kind of fell into PR. And I got to work with real estate clients. I moved to another agency. I've worked at three agencies, interior design and hospitality, which has been my favorite because I got to travel a lot and work with hotels. And I think similar to what Corianne said, being prepared and immersing yourself in the industries you work in is so valuable. So start now, start reading the news, implementing that into your day, because that's what, if you go into PR or any agency, that's what your clients are going to want to know. So it's a good habit to build now. And then I loved um, helping coach clients. We did a lot of media training, and that's how I kind of fell into my job now as a learning consultant. So in my job now, we do workshops and private coaching, and we teach people how to be better communicators, whether that's presentation skills or executive presence. So we do all of those things, and I get to travel a lot. The office is in New York City, which is great. So I'm really loving it so far. Awesome. Do you want to start us off, or do you mind starting us off in responding to the next question, which is really just tell us about a typical day or maybe a few different typical days uh, in your current position. Like yes. A day in the life. Of course. So in my job, no day is the same, which I'm sure is the same for many people on this panel, marketing, PR. There's no day like a new thing could come any day. So my role is two distinct things. It's taking care of our clients and seeing how we could help them and finding great solutions for them. And then it's also teaching. So we go into different companies and we do trainings and coachings. Um, so it's two parts. So no day is the same. And I love that. How do you, I mean, do you have a roster of clients that yeah. your organization typically serves or you're assigned to how, how do you know sort of who you do trainings for, or who you um, coach? Yeah. So I'm lucky enough in my job, um, they have a list of clients that we could reach out to, but it's also in my role, it's partially sales too. So it's reaching out to people I know, making those connections. So that's what I'm doing now. Um, I started at the role this year. Um, so making those connections and reaching out to my network. So it's really important. This job is a perfect example of that. Stay in touch with your network, follow up with people, check in on them because you never know 
when you might reach out to them again. Great. Does anyone or who wants to jump in next on that question? Talk to us about a typical day. I'll say for me, um, it's tons of meetings. Um, it's a, a lot of moving pieces. So being able to collaborate um, with different uh, cross-functional team members, basically meaning people that work on different teams and to all work towards one goal. Uh, obviously we have a hybrid model, so it's either we're in person or on Zooms a lot, uh, figuring things out, figuring out strategies, figuring out plans, uh, uh, go to market uh, strategies, et cetera. But uh, a lot of planning and a lot of conversation. <laughs> Hi. Corianne, do you care to share a typical day? Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, you're good. You, you can go, D. D, <laughs> Thank you. Day first. Okay, sure. Uh, so similar, again, similar to Ray, but a lot of meetings for sure. But um, I think another part of my day is a lot of, and this was a surprise to me, a lot of Excel, a lot of um, just looking at data in different ways. Um, and a lot of, so number crunching in Excel, meetings for sure. Uh, uh, and I want to say doing a lot of reports and building decks and making presentations. Uh, if I were to sum up, like, I guess the three things that I'm doing a lot on a day to day. Yeah, so I would say um, definitely a lot of meetings. <laughs> Um, but generally we start our day, you know, in terms of my department. And that's one of the things that I love is like building a department and bringing together, you know, really great people who are excited about marketing. Right. So, um, we start our day with review of the hot list, right? Make sure that we're on track for the day because a lot of different things will come up during the day. And I need to make sure that if I am putting out fires or in meetings all day, that the team were focused on our deliverables, right? Because, um, you know, again, in, once you advance a lot of what you're doing, like you had said, um, you know, right, is that cross-functional coordination and collaboration working through the strategies because, you know, there's always a hiccup. You're always kind of pivoting. And I would say it, being flexible is really important, right? So it's like, I know every day is going to be different. One of the things that I do um, to keep kind of that work-life balance, because I will say I am a reformed workaholic, which is what agencies will do to you but you kind of do it while you're young. So is I block part of my day to actually get work done. So I have work blocks every day, which is straight up like turn off teams, turn off email and go through review documents, plans. Like there's a lot of PowerPoints, presentations. Um, everybody thinks they're a marketer. And so you also have to kind of educate people and re-educate people and why you're doing things. So um, that's a lot of the day. And I also say, take care of yourself. I go to Orange Theory during lunch. And I make no apologies for that because you have to find, you know, time for you. And it also helps me refocus in terms of like the rest of the day. So. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so the next thing I'm curious about is how or in what ways did your experiences at UAlbany prepare you for the, the work that you're doing now or the work that you've done. And you spoke, some of you have spoken to some of this, uh, but I'm sort of wondering, you know, what can you identify, um, asked a different way, what can you identify in terms of what students could or should be doing right now to prepare to kind of fill, fill your shoes? Um, I think something or a couple of things that I definitely, I'm happy that I did while I was back in New Albany was, they, and we all say this so much, but it's true. Get involved. Um, get in as just get into as many as many groups as possible, just to get into the position of feeling comfortable. One, just interacting with different people, wearing different hats in an organization. Maybe just understand what those roles are, so you can figure out what path you might want to be when you venture out to work within an actual organization is one thing I could say. Um, another thing that I was happy that I did was like, I was very, I was thinking around with Photoshop a lot. Um, I was doing, um, I was probably 
head of like communications or head of like press, uh, press, uh, public relations back in whatever organizations I was in on campus. So those things made me like in charge of making the flyers, in charge of doing the social media posts. Um, so those things right now help me now learn how to make ad copy or like understand what a call to action is, so to speak. So I could say those and. Something that I wish I did, I know that might have not been the question, something I wish I did because I mentioned the Excel portion, I would tell students to take um, classes within business. Uh, I think one of the panelists said that they have a minor in business, and I think that would be something that I wish I ventured out to because it would have helped me with Excel for sure. Um, I had no idea how much I would have been using Excel as much as I do, but <laughs> um, I would definitely save that. And the only other thing I would say, um, is making sure that you're attending events like these more. Go to networking events. Go get familiar with like what's going on in the industry trends as you talk to these people in these panels and things like that. Those are all things that I think I did and was very happy about and think um, would be helpful for students. How can people network? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, no, networking is it's a muscle that you have to exercise, I must say. Um, you, But it, it becomes natural, honestly. It just becomes like a form of conversation. You have to think about, well, what do you want to gain from this conversation? Where? What is the point of you being at the event that you're at? Um, where do you want to... It's pretty much like a where do you want to go? What do you want to get from this conversation? How can you also help that person maybe? Because you, you could develop relationships in many different ways in networking. So you just want to just have a goal, I guess, when you have these conversations. Just don't pick up random. Um, I don't even know if people do business cards anymore. But don't just follow random people on Instagram or LinkedIn and think that that's going to help. You have to uh, be purposeful with who you're reaching out to and making sure you follow up with those people and just develop a relationship organically, I would say, for sure. Thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It just, you said networking. I said, oh, how do we do that? Um, oh, yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, we were thinking about you all the new experiences and yeah. to what extent they prepared you. Let's uh, see. Jessica, go ahead. Yeah. I'll go. Um, I would say just from my experience, don't minimize any experience you have at the university. You never know what you're going to use in your career. For me, um, two things that were huge for me that I'm using now. I was um, president of the National Panhellenic Council. And from there, I went to work up for the Office of Fraternity and Sorority Life. And there I did a lot of presentations. I did a lot of um, called the New Member Leadership Institute. So I spoke to a large groups of students at period of uh, various points throughout the year. And I thought that was gonna be important, but I didn't know how important that was gonna be. And now I teach in my job. So that is so valuable to me right now. And then the second thing I did, I was a purple and gold student ambassador, which like Dee was saying, we networked a lot with different alumni and we learned how to talk to alumni and we learned how to get information from them and see how like their experiences could benefit us. Um, I actually went to a panel when I was an undergrad and Ray was there. So it's nice to be on, on a panel with you today um, and use those experiences. And again, like Dee said, follow up and make sure like you're keeping those connections alive. Don't just follow up right after you meet them, check in with them, maybe say happy new year. That's a good time to check in. So just keep checking in and those things should set you up. Yeah, I wanted to answer too, if that's cool. Um, echoing what both Jessica and Dee uh, stated, uh, just really get involved. Like outside of football, I did, uh, I worked at the library. <laughs> um, I did student association. Um, I ran into real sports. Um, and I was just part of clubs and I was I do parties, <laughs> like, you know, take as many, I, what I was, what I always say to people is uh, when I always get to ask the question about going to a community college versus going to a big university, the beauty of going to a big university is the opportunity to experience and meet new people. And the best way to do that is to get involved. And um, for me, it's, it's worked. It's, it's done everything. Like, everything that where I'm at now is literally through networking through things that I've done uh the the alumni panel that I met uh my first uh technically boss was from playing football 
Um, and then obviously that internship with Monty Lippman was me going through the community center. Um, and so just take advantage of the resources that you guys have and legit just really just get involved. Well, and I think that, you know, your education is what you make of it, right? You know, and getting involved, being engaged, and the only way that you're really going to succeed in this field, because it is so fast paced and changing, is to be curious and to want to be involved. You always, you're you always learning, right? Because trends, tactics, strategies, it's always changing. So if you're curious and you want to get involved, I mean, you're going to be very successful, right? In terms of like that type of engagement. Um, you know, I think one of the things, so I went to, I was working full-time and was part-time getting my master's. And one of the things that I appreciated about, um, you know, SUNY Albany versus St. Rose is I did a lot more writing, a lot more persuasive writing and a lot more research. So, um, I do a ton of research now, <laughs> um, you know, in, just in terms of clinical trials and products and that type of thing. So, I mean, I think that was really key because it's it's it was different. And I, I really appreciated that element of it in the writing. So and the intensity of that. Uh, this is some of my own um, curiosity. All of you were at UAlbany pre-COVID. And so there's been a, you know, we we all transitioned to online and some of us are still maybe clinging it, clinging to it, right? Doing things virtually. Um what I'm trying to think about how to ask it. I'm just curious if you think, you know, your your collegiate experience or your graduate experience, could it have been replaced with virtual interactions or would you encourage people to be in person? <laughs> be in person. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> be in person. <laughs> What is the role of maybe, what do you think, and it would be a great discussion, what do you think the role of online virtual interactions like this could be in higher ed? Yeah, Jessica, go ahead. Um, the virtual, what do you mean? Sorry, the virtual, the role of. Oh, I was just curious. I mean, I think this is my own opinion, but I think some of the Zooming and some of the virtual is here to stay. So I yeah. tried to think about, well, what is the role of it then? Sort of what roles should it play in collegiate or graduate student experiences? So like, I think, it's okay to do this online, but don't yeah. do this online kind of thing. I think if I were in school now, I know connecting with alumni was a big thing for me and like getting to hear their story. So using Zoom is a great opportunity for that because there's a lot of alums in New York City. I mean, we're all over the, the country and the world. So that would be a great opportunity. So when you go to a networking event, you might want to say, would you be able to hop on a call for five minutes? Because we're not necessarily in Albany or 20 minutes or whatever. Um, but that might be a great way to use zero as part of your experience. There's kind of like a time and a place for it, right? There's a balance. So, you know, I think about um, the professors that I had when I was at SUNY, um, you know, at Univalbini and, you know, for as part of my master's and that engagement, you can't replace that in person with Zoom, right? You know, even um, I work remote, but then I go into corporate once a month and then I'm out in the field and I'm with our sales reps. That one-on-one -on -one engagement, we got a lot done via Zoom meetings and whatnot, but being able to connect with people and see them as people and versus just, you know, the work, at, which is, almost a little bit more transactional through Zoom. I don't know. But yeah, so I think, um, you know, there's there's a balance, right? Because Zoom has given us a lot of opportunities, um, you know, to, again, I would have never had this opportunity being the head of marketing at a device and biopharmaceutical company if I didn't live in New Jersey or live on Long Island. So, I mean, but the in-person connection, it's still really powerful, so... Thank you. Okay. Um, we've had, I, I saw a question, I think it might have actually been in the chat, but about um, kind of those early, early stages interview tips. How do you uh, succeed in an interview, perhaps fairly early on in your career? Um, what, what kinds of interview tips might you offer? 
Um, I think a big one that I have for me is you always want to be asking the other person questions. In my job, we say the most important thing is to focus on others rather than yourself. So you want to hear their story and you want to ask them questions about how they got to where they are. They are. Um, so that's a great thing. And you can hear about their role and what it has succeeded for them. Um, so that, that's my biggest tip. <laughs> I would say even before, you know, the interview, as you're developing your cover letter, as you're developing your resume, do not say that you're proficient in something that you are not proficient in, because you will get called out on it in an interview, right? So it's, you know, I've had people say that they're proficient in certain, you know, suits of software and whatnot, and then you have conversations with them and you're asking them how they use it and, and you know, and, and they don't know. So it's, if you're putting something on your resume, be true to your experience. And, you know, if you're not necessarily confident in your experience, go volunteer somewhere. Everybody's, you know, you can volunteer. Everybody loves interns. I mean, I, I got, my interns made me so much, helped me be so much better at PowerPoint presentations. I gotta tell you, they were just coming out of college and they were like giving PowerPoint presentations all the time. You know, there's things that you learn. So, I mean, just internships and whatnot, and just get the experience if you don't have it. So that's what I would recommend. I think something I would recommend is definitely practice um interviewing as much as you can um whether it be uh with a friend uh, your mom um a mentor they actually have apps now um that you can use to help practice as well but i think practicing so that you feel comfortable answering questions just knowing what something people are going to ask you is something that i find to be very important uh additionally i think echoing both what jessica and corianne said is like something I want to add on to that is when you look at these jobs that you want to apply to, I would say like really try to understand what they're asking you, like know what they're asking you if you're going to be able to do so that one, you can ask yourself, hey, can I really do that? Do I know how to do that? Or is there a way that I can, is there any skills that I can transfer to help me get this done maybe? But all of that to say like really try to marry your cover letter and your experience to the actual position because that's what you're going to be doing on your day to day. So you want to be able to lean on those skills for sure. And brush up on the company. Yes. Right oh Trust my goodness. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That is the worst. When And you start asking, <laughs> ask questions about why and what interest, and they don't. And I'm like, okay, we're done. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> products Definitely. like that. So. And I saw Melissa just posted in the chat. Take your resume to career services while you're at school. They will review it and look at it and really help you. I know I did that when I was a sophomore, I think. And I think I went like a few times and they really helped me refine my resume, refine my cover letters. So utilize the services mm -hmm. that are there for you. For sure. I spent hours in career. Yes. Like, don't, <laughs> yes, don't think that, like, that's what they're there for, guys. Like, please use these services. Some of you have mentioned things here or there, but I'm curious if there's any materials or resources that the students could be sort of reading, tapping into now. So I heard career services, I heard some different organizations, but and, and read the news, things like that, um, that you would encourage students to be doing now so they will be prepared, um, have those good habits in place kind of down the line. Um. Sorry, Ray, you go if you work. Mm -hmm. um, I know. Go for, ahead. <laughs> yeah. um, for me, um, something very popular in the PR industry is called PR Net. They have an Instagram account. And I wished that when I was very act when I was an undergrad, that I would have been following it. They post internships, they post jobs, they post things happening in the industry. So definitely that would be something to follow if you're interested in pursuing that route. Can you really quickly uh, explain? PR sort of in comparison to marketing. Yes. But maybe even advertising, sort of how do you, the lay of the land from your perspective? Yes. So PR is a little bit different. So we say PR is earned rather than paid. So any story that we secure in the media, like any relationship that we is, and sorry, any story that is in the media, we secured organically. So we had to make that relationships with our with a journalist to get them to write about our client. So that's the real crux of PR. It's making those relationships with journalists and then having them wanting to write about your client. 
So everything's organic, nothing's paid. Yeah. I mean, I would also say that um, sometimes the lines blur a little bit, like yeah. if you're placements. So what we do when we're developing our media plans is I also look at their editorial calendars yeah. as we're mm -hmm. going through the marketing, you know, the strategy with media, because if we're buying uh, placements and whatnot, then, you know, given their editorial calendar and pitching, I would expect, I mean, there is still some pay for play, but. But so I would when say, you say marketing, how do you, think paid, of, yeah. how do you think of marketing? How would you explain that? What does it include? So in my, in my marketing experience, I do include PR, like, but I just, again, I'm like, as a head of marketing, I'm all encompassing with, in terms of like, you know, the PR, you know, advertising, media, you know, all of that. I see it as all encompassing multi-channel, right? So can I be back there? Uh, I just want to think about like the idea of multi-channel and like marketing being like maybe the overarching umbrella for everything because I think of it that way too um, even though I like even though I might lean more on the advertising end because the things that I put out you have to pay for versus the things that on Jessica's side there is earned um, that's like you said it's more organic I am advertising we have sponsored ads you pay for these things but when we talk about media planning overarching with marketing we do have for example we do talk to our PR team who works on the same brand that I do I talk to the social team who works on the same brand that I do and then we have the search team and then we might have um for we call it out of home but like these are like the the billboards that you see in Times Square like that's a whole nother channel so like it's just different areas of marketing um but they all have that I guess so to speak to your own their own specialties if that makes sense and it all ties back to the business strategy, right? So you're all the mix, you know, whether it's advertising, PR, whatnot, you're all supporting all of these elements. These are your tools to help achieve, you know, your strategic objectives, you know, as part of the overall business plan or, or the brand plan for your product. So, I mean, that's just kind of the way I also see it is, and that's, that's the other thing too, as a marketer, you need to truly understand the strategy, Right and the goals and what you're looking to achieve. Um, I am constantly fighting for dollars in my budget and our CFO is like, what's the ROI on that? Sometimes you can measure it, sometimes you can't. I mean, I, I do love, you know, more of the, the data-driven, uh, you know, tactics where, you know, I can kind of tie things back and sometimes, um, you know, that I'm able to get more money to fund those projects. But again, sometimes you can't measure the ROI um, and you just know based on the industry. But again, you know, it's it's understand the overall strategy because I'm fighting for dollars versus, you know, our clinical team versus engineering in Madison and they have to balance what is going to get them sales, right? What's going to make us money, so... Thank you. I took us on a tangent. Did anyone want to jump in with any particular resources or things you wish you had referenced or that students should be referencing? And then I think uh, we'll we'll switch a look and, and do some of the uh, questions from the Q and A. Dee, did you want to share? Yeah, for advertising, I do want to. Oops, sorry, I do want to uh, mention the two sites, Ad Week and Ad Age. Uh, those are two sites for. I, it, they do focus on advertising, but they do look at just the industry as a whole in a way that I think can give people a good like bounce board to other sites as well. So those are two sites I definitely would recommend. I just have one more thing to add for PR. If you know, I know um, you're interested in a particular industry, start learning about the journalists that are active in this industry now. So start reading magazines, start reading newspapers, because if you go into interview for an internship, and you're interested in travel, and you know all the top travel journalists, you're going to stand out. Yeah. So. One last thing I'll add is also just pay attention to your social media platforms that you guys are on all the time. Like, take notice of how brands are engaging with you guys on there. And uh, yeah, just take note uh, on the things that you guys love to engage with when you're watching Hulu and there's a commercial, you're wondering why they chose that commercial, et cetera. So you guys are like kind of living, uh, you guys are the consumer. So at the end of the day, just take note of what's around you. Yeah, 
Yeah. One thing that I would add um, that I think, you know, in terms of a shift in direction, right? So sales and marketing work really closely together. I would say the funnel is dead. The flywheel is where we're at today, right? So I would say to truly understand, you know, the CRM tools that are available, you know, HubSpot, Salesforce, get certified, know those inside mm -hmm. and out, because I got to tell you, you know, in terms of my engagement, I cannot achieve my goals without the partnership with sales, right? So, and we're working together because it doesn't just stop once they become a customer. You have to engage those customers. You have to keep them happy. They become promoters. They talk to other people about your products. They become spokespeople for you, right? So it's not just about getting them through the funnel anymore. You know, it is ongoing engagement. You know, it's all about, you know, the, and the customer journey as well. So there's a lot of, you know, to understand, you know, HubSpot, get your certification. Some of the stuff you can do for free and just understand the tools that are out there, right? So sorry, you mentioned HubSpot and I wanted to just plug uh, Coursera as well. Um, especially, I think if you live in New York or a New York State resident, I think you don't even have to pay for those uh, courses. So in addition to anything that you might learn on campus, that might be another place to get like certified in other things as well. Excellent. So I'm looking at some of the questions asked and one makes a good point. Uh, notice that most of uh, the panelists are graduates of our MA in COM program, so the master's program, and they were curious if you could speak about maybe your program experience and how an MA was something that helped you in the marketing field. Or why did you do it? <laughs> sure. Um, I could speak on my experience having an MA. Um, I can say one, how it helps me in the field now is a lot of the reporting that I mentioned I do I did before. Um, I think writing my thesis and just trying to understand data and learning how to speak about data is was very helpful. Um, when I'm talking all the way back to just this intro to stats um, at the graduate level, I remember the first time I had to hear the word stat sig at work, I was like, oh no, we're back. But uh, <laughs> all that to say, it did help and it, it, it helps me to just know how to speak on performance versus like so when you're reading these different uh research articles and learning about different strategies that are taken i can definitely say that it helped me just look at so many things in so many different ways another thing that i could say it helped me with is just like trying to understand just the different kinds of marketing the different levels and how different ways it could be used was another thing that i could say my master's helped me with i could go on and on honestly but um I will say that I didn't expect my master's to be as helpful as it was. I kind of, um, uh, I didn't mention this before, but I am an EOP student as well. But as the EOP student, I was kind of shaky, like knowing, all right, can I go now? Can I feel confident in where I'm going? Or can I still just feel, just get my education and feel more armed as much as I can? So with that, I just took a leap of faith and was just like, hey, let me just buckle down and make sure I use all my resources as possible. Similar to what um, other people say, make sure you use your resources. So can I didn't we dispel, think it would help, but it did. Can we dispel the myth then? People say, oh, I want to be a comm major. I want to go in comm because I don't like math, but I, I counter with you Again. need to understand numbers. You need, you need to like you this, need to love the data. Oh my God. Understand how to so use much of marketing is data driven, right? Like I... Mm -hmm. All of it. I mean, we buy a lot of data and you need to interpret that data. You need to leverage that data. Right. You need to slice. Right. It. It's yeah. So, I mean, absolutely. I but don't say, be scared of it. No, Sorry. don't be scared of it. Embrace it because it makes you smarter. It makes you a smarter marketer, right? Like the, mm -hmm. again, you know, one of the things too with that, you know, receiving, getting an advanced degree, it shows motivation, right? And we talked about like getting involved in clubs and things like that. It shows motivation to continue to, you know, advance as a professional. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, I think the things I learned in my master's, like one of the things I remember, I had one professor who did random debates. And so you had to be ready at any time, you didn't know when you were being called on. And so for me now in my job, if I get called on to 
ask a question or what's going on with this report, I'm always ready and prepared and ahead. And then in another class I took, we studied how uh, CEOs presented themselves and how did they communicate well and what worked and what didn't work. And I'm using those skills in my job now when I coach people. So it's like little things that you don't think are gonna be relevant to your career. Those are the things that are the most important. For sure. Ray, did you want to add something? I saw you unmute initially and then then mute again. So it's up to you. <laughs> Everyone touched on the same points that I would have touched on, but I'd say specifically just around research. I think right out, out of uh, um, getting my MA, understanding uh, qualitative and quantitative research and how that plays into marketing uh, is really, really big. You'd be so surprised. Uh, but yeah, similar to everyone else, like... Uh, I, I really do believe that grad school is the point where I felt like I was actually learning some things that I could take into my career, so. I agree. Yeah, you made a great point, point around the qualitative and quantitative and also understand the value of primary and secondary research, right? In terms of sizing the market or the type of research that you need to do in person, right? Like, so, and qualitative versus quantitative. Yeah, so there's a time and a place and it's all valuable. So, and also, sorry. No, please go ahead. Sure? Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I'll, also, I'll remember. It's fine. Those Blackboard posts that you have to do, I know they seem annoying right now, but like you write so much in our job, those are again invaluable because mm -hmm. you get to learn how to write better. You get to learn how to get to your points quicker, and that's very mm -hmm. relevant for our field. So definitely use those Blackboard posts and make sure you're working hard on them. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I think the thing that I wanted to say, I think especially that's important in this day and age that I got from my master's as well, um, is increased media literacy. Um, I think with um, what we were talking about with like research, you have to know what is the good sources? <laughs> what are, where should I be listening and what, or what, are, what is reliable data and how to look at things properly? Is this something that I think was another great tool I got from my master's as well? Awesome. Next question, this was on my list too, so I like it. Um, what does what do you like most about your job or the work that you currently do? What are some of the, the highlights for you? Um, I'll go. Uh, for me, everything that I touch is like future facing. As I said, I'm in AR, VR, and uh, AI. So for me, I'm, I, I don't have a technical background. So learning all of these, about all of these devices and the way people see the future in the next five to 10 years is like, is what keeps me really, really interested and intrigued. Um, I would say the one thing, you know, there are a lot of things that I love about my job, you know, being able to market um, in the US and globally, right? The global markets are really interesting. Um, and we have a really robust pipeline. Um, so I'm really interested in, you know, the go-to-market strategy, like commercialization, you know, in building those brands from basically, you know, phase one clinical trials, right? So for Beyond Cancer, which is immuno-oncology, immunotherapy, we're producing our first in-human data. We're releasing that next week. And this, and I believe in my products, and it is like so exciting to think that you get to work on a product that could change the shape of cancer treatment. So, I mean, it's just like, if you love your products, that's like, it's motivating. So, and building brands. I love to build brands. I'll just say that. <laughs> Every aspect of it. Um, for me, my favorite part of my job is connecting with different people. We get to work with so many different clients across different industries. And then also the work I do really helps people because a lot of people are nervous to give presentations and a lot of people are nervous to even speak to their boss. And we make that little difference of helping them feel more confident. And that's super, super rewarding. Excellent. Um, do you have any professional experience, uh, sort of unrelated to your industry, to the work that you're doing, uh, that allowed you to 
excel. So these are sort of, you know, recreational activities, non-work-based activities that have helped you be successful in your work. I'd say sports, playing sports. Um, you know, I played softball in college and teamwork because that element um, and part of so many different teams and being able to appreciate that, you know, various folks excel in different areas and leveraging those folks and their expertise and those relationships to win. Um, I think that's probably something that I found is very useful, um, you know. Thank you. So a couple of questions that seem to be centered on um, tips for breaking into marketing. So one question was, you know, someone who graduated, had a position in a different industry and wants to sort of transfer in. Are recruiters useful? Um, should we have, should, should people interested in marketing positions have an online portfolio? There's a question seemed to be about like, how do you, how do you break in? How do you get a foot in the door? I would say, ideally, first thing, tap into your network. The, like I said, the alumni uh, that Albany has is, you. there's someone in, literally, and I'm amazed sometimes about the alumni, alumni roster that is available at the University of Albany. So tap into that Albany network, first off. But um, other than that, internships are huge. When I was at Albany, I did a marketing internship at the most uh, at the Times Union Center. And so I guess my point is, is that if you don't get that dream internship of like, oh, I want to intern at the MBA in the marketing team there, but you could get something that's maybe local, that's in a marketing department around you, get that experience. Um, you'd be surprised how hands on and all of the information that you want, uh, information that you need to understand the field, uh, you'd get through that. And so, yeah, those are those are pretty big for me. Definitely, obviously, tapping into alumni, getting internship experience, and then also when it comes to like promoting yourself, really get start to get active on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has become a truly a social media platform. Post, show your writing ability. Um, I've seen people uh review a advertising campaign and provided their thoughts on it and then maybe put uh a recommendations on things that they would have liked to see um start creating a personality on uh linkedin as like a thought leader in a sense a younger thought leader that will also open some eyes and recruiters definitely do work uh add those people as your friends uh on linkedin as well um but yeah i think that's and get them out. Um, piggybacking on to piggybacking off those ends, um, I think another thing that people can utilize are some of the organizations or foundations that are within just the communication industry. So, the Emma Bowen Foundation that is a good uh, organization that's like helps young people within communications, like with just broadening their network. Everything that I'm going to say really might just tie back to networking, but it's very huge within our industry. Um, everybody knows somebody and it's very small. I think Jessica said she saw Ray at a, at a, at a panel before I've, I've seen Ray's name. I've seen Ray before as well. I'm positive. So it's like our industry is very small. Um, so networking is very helpful. The Emma Bowen Foundation is one um, industry, I think, I mean, excuse me, one organization I think is helpful. The T. Howard Foundation is another organization I think is helpful to just connect you with other people who are, you know, trying to get in the industry and also get you to the companies that you might want to um, interact with. Those are two, and I'm trying to think, four A's is another one, but all in all, do your research on in foundations and organizations within communications that will help you increase your network so that you can get to know other people, get to know um, organizations, and even get to know different jobs that you might not even know are like out there for you. Yeah, definitely the industry trade association. Like, yeah, so absolutely. Um, for PR, there's like a lot of Facebook groups. Like I know there's like a PR ops one where like a lot of industry professionals are in there. And even though like, if you're not in the field yet, 
maybe join it anyway. And you could see like what types of things transpire. And if you see someone interesting, message them. You like you have nothing to lose. So might as well make that connection. So look for those Facebook groups. Those have been helpful. This was a specific question. Um, how do you balance being interested without or with sorry, how do you balance being interested with being interesting when networking? Um, other than following up after conversations, how do you engage in a way that you make a good and lasting first impression without feeling pushy? Can I jump in here? Because I like to do my, one of my favorite things. Um, and so I think this is something that somebody else said before. Make it all about them. Like you're going to talk to them about their day-to-day, -day, their job. And when you follow up with them, it's like, well, hi, Susan. Uh, I loved our conversation about the different gardenia flowers you like. And she'll remember you because you mentioned the flowers that she liked. There's just those little tidbits that will make you stand out a little bit more. Um, this sounds so crazy that I'm mentioning this, but there's a book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. We, we were told to read it back in undergrad, really read it, it helps. <laughs> um, it, those little tidbits really help you just how to talk to people and make a lasting impression and how to influence people, literally. I think also a good thing to do is, I think I mentioned this before, but make sure like when you make a connection, don't follow up with them too much that you're bombarding with them, but check in with them regularly because you don't want to get to a point where like you want them to review your resume or maybe they're, you're interested in their company that like it's been two years since you've talked to them and you just say, hey, how are you? Because that, that look, doesn't look good. Um, so definitely like once you make a connection, um, follow up on that regularly rather than just when you need something. And Jessica, something that you had mentioned kind of got me thinking about interviewing. Okay. Nobody thinks about writing thank you letters anymore after an interview. Like send a thank you within oh. 24 hours or else you're not even going to be considered for the position. Yeah. In most cases. Email. Yes. Email question mark. Okay. Email. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So. <laughs> and also piggybacking off of that, don't inter make sure like if you're like interviewing with a group, don't just send a thank you to your contact. You'll stand out if you send a thank you to everyone you spoke to. So, and make each of them a little different. Don't make it the yes, same. Thing. Don't make it the same thing. <laughs> Did you have a personal online portfolio? Have you, do you have one or have you seen those and are they useful? For PR, once you get start getting involved in the industry, you might want to start making a list of articles, but start honestly, like writing samples are a big thing in PR because we write so much take your favorite essay and bring it to your interview with you and say, or like after the interview, when you send, send a thank you, say, hi, like I have some writing samples that I'd love to share with you. Would you be able to take a look? So pick your two favorite writing assignments that you did in a creative writing class and keep those on file to share. Sorry, I'm looking looking at questions. Um, so the question is sort of about is a master's in com enough for the marketing field, or are there different types of degrees that people could or should consider? I mean, you could get an MBA. I think it just depends on what you want to do, right? So it's not required. A master's isn't required. I mean, I got a job working in communications you know, as the director of communications for a state senator, and I was getting my master's, right? Like, again, it's not required, but as you want to advance, you know, an MBA or an MA, you know, and for, I think, you know, I heard some of the folks on the panel mentioned that they got their MA with a concentration in political, right? So if that's an area that you're interested in, right, I was more interested in political communications than, you know, the MBA side of things, because I thought I was, you know, going to go to Washington and, you know, whatnot. I didn't. But, you know, so again, if there's an area that you're really interested, focus on that. But again, it's it's not mandatory. I work with a lot of people who are brilliant who don't have their masters, so. I agree. I think the MBA would be maybe my second option if, the, if I didn't have my MA. But when you think about your specialty, I would say that you might want to, to, to her point, is just know what 
you want to to do because it really gets really focused, so to speak, and you don't want to feel pigeonholed. Um, the nice thing about the master's in communications program is you do have to take courses in all of the different concentrations. So I got concentrated in political communications, but I don't work in politics now. And I'm using those courses that I took in organizational communications and interpersonal communication. So really pay attention to those courses because you're going to use a little bit of everything. Are there any specific like certificates that you would recommend folks get to be in the marketing workforce? Oh, these are. Um, I mean, I just mentioned, you know, the HubSpot and Salesforce, you know, they've got certificates and whatnot. And just again, because as marketers, we really do leverage those tools in combination with our sales teams. So um, being familiar with those. I mean, it's great because I'll be honest with you, like we're, we're going through Salesforce implementation and a lot of the folks who are overseeing and heads of departments and whatnot, because I work with sales ops and whatnot, they don't understand it. But so you're also trying to implement it correctly. You know, and my, one of my, my marketing director has just like dug in. I mean, I understand I've worked in HubSpot. I built pages, done CSA, whatever, but I mean, it's, you know, having though that expertise is you start to become, you become more valuable because you know the ins and the outs. Then you've got consultants who are trying to sell you on all these other things. And I've got my marketing director. She's like, wait, we already have part of that tool. We don't need to upgrade. I watched like five YouTube videos and we're sad. And, you know, I've watched all the, you know, the Salesforce videos on it. So again, knowledge is power. So. Each of you sort of mentioned multiple positions. How did you know when it was time to move on or take a new opportunity? Interesting enough for me, like I said, I started in uh, music and similar to D, I was just, I was afraid for stability um, and wondering if I'd get hired after my internship, just because in the music industry, a lot of people stay there a long time. Um, and pharmaceutical advertising, that was my first way into corporate, but I knew I didn't want to stay there. I had no background in bio. So, and science wasn't something that I was like really, really excited about. So I was always, my eye was always on consumer marketing and, and landing there. And so I just, I made strategic moves to slowly get me there. And when I got to BBDO, I actually got there for uh, working on the consumer side of pharmaceutical. And once I got there, I was sitting close to the Foot Locker team and they're like, oh, we need you on this account. And so my transition, uh, it was strategic, but uh, if I could tell you like I planned it out, I didn't. Um, and then even my change to the brand side on the marketing side where I'm at now here at Meta, I, honestly was at a point in my career where I did like 10 years in advertising and I was questioning if I wanted to do it long-term, if I wanted to stay at the agency I was at, uh, which was a great agency and I was happy, or if I wanted to try something completely different. And when Meta reached out, that was like my completely different. It kind of, they, they caught me at a crossroad. And so I, I was able to make that move. And it was something that I always wanted to do, but wasn't sure of the timing. Um, so oh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you could try to plan it out. It, it might not work the way that you plan, that you plan, but um, at the end of the day, try to at least think of your North Star and just keep walking towards that and you'll just end up going like this. And, to, <laughs> and you, you never know where you'll end up, but at least you'll know where you want to go. Well, to your point with the North Star, right? It's like no you know, once you're in an agency and don't be afraid to move around. Like my parents were like, oh my gosh, you're switching agencies or you're doing this. And I, you know, I'm like, I'm not staying in the same position. I will die intellectually if I don't challenge myself and move to something new. So, you know, as you start to think about, you get some experience and you're like, oh, I would love to be on client side. Cause that was like my dream to be client side after I'd worked with my clients. And I was like, I'm kind of doing your job anyway. Um, so I was like, I could do this and you guys have better work-life balance and you get paid more. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm done being agency. <laughs> um, but then I knew that I had some weaknesses, right? So I wanted to, you know, fill some of those voids, get some additional experience and, 
my opportunity was going in with a startup, right? So it, and, and that's a risk, right? So it's like, you've got to be willing to take risks to get the experience. So again, the startup was the best thing that I had done and, you know, helped me get the position that I'm at now. So. Um, I think for me, prior to my job now, I was at three different en- agencies and from there, it was also trying to get to where I was interested in travel. So I moved to an agency because I was specifically interested in travel. But I'm sure many people during the pandemic, I was unfortunately laid off from a job and I had to go back to my network, something we've been talking about this this whole panel. So it's important to keep those relationships because I wouldn't have gotten to my next role if I didn't keep those relationships that I found through my time at UAlbany. Dee, did you want to add something? Yes, but I, everybody touched on it, but I tried, I was trying to just bring another point to it. But I think all in all, I think it's really just good to be flexible. Um, I don't think that uh, my path was linear by any means. Um, and I just want to just say, with that being the case, like even me doing pharmaceutical marketing, marketing right now, I was so like, that was the last thing I think I said I wanted to do. But um, it there's still so much you can gain from it. There's so much, there's still an experience. There's still things that you could learn from different positions. So I would say be flexible and have an open mind is what I would want to add on to that. Yeah. Well, folks, we are at time. Uh, so if any of the, actually I'll ask, ask each of the panelists just to, if you wanted to make, you know, say any last um, closing comments, you know, briefly uh, and or look in the Q&A. There's some shorter questions that if anyone of you all from the panel wanted to answer, um, you may feel free to do so. Uh, but if each of you would just have a, a closing thought um, for the evening, it would be wonderful. Um, I would say enjoy your time at UAlbany. It was my favorite time in the past like few years of my career. Um, take advantage of every opportunity because again, you never know what it's going to lead to. And I wish you the best of luck. Anyone else closing comments? I would say tap into the alumni. Yes. That's like repeatedly, like that is your <laughs> automatic network and you have resources like Patricia and Melissa that could probably get you in contact with anyone. Uh, when people see Albany in their email, they won't answer. Uh, also, I will say, at the end of the day, we're all trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, no one really knows what they're doing until they do it. So never like allow yourself to limit yourself because you think, I, I don't know this or et cetera. Uh, like I said, everybody's figuring it out and you'd be surprised at how high, high, high up and certain levels, people are still trying to figure it out. So um, never uh, question yourself, just like, just do it. Yeah, one of the things that I've always said, you know, to folks on my teams, as I'm like, listen, we're all going to make mistakes. I don't care. Like, I mean, I don't want you to make major huge mistakes. This is going to cost us a ton of money, but no, no, but it's like, everybody's going to make mistakes. I said, I don't want you to get down. I want you to learn from your mistake and quickly recover, right? Like that is the worst. If you're like, oh, I totally screwed this up. It's like, yeah, be accountable. That's one thing that I don't think a lot of people are accountable. Be accountable, own it and recover and fix. Like learn something from it because you know what? You're not going to make the same mistake again if you really think about it. (laughs) So, you know, the other thing that I look at across, you know, teamwork and is just, if you're focused on also setting people up for success, right? And everything that you do, you know, in terms of marketing and relationships and working in companies, you know, that's another philosophy. Set up, set people up for success, right? And then you're going to have great relationships with folks. And if you give them the right materials, they're going to stop coming back to you and asking a lot of questions because that also helps you in the long run too. Just do it the right way. And, you know. Excellent. I think, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, but like one thing that somebody said to me when I started my career in advertising and marketing is like, this is the same way that uh, your friends might be studying to be doctors or study to be lawyers. Take this as a practice as well. This like 
being a communication professional is a practice. You have to brush up on your skills in the industry just as much as a lawyer might have to, just as much as anybody else. So you want to make sure that you take this just as serious and just stay ahead of it and challenge yourself to just really be the best that you can be and learn as much as you can within this. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you again. I think this has been really interesting and exciting and informative. And I wish panelists and everyone um, on who's been a participant all the best. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Take thank care. You. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Thank you, guys.